very much. Um, we have a prize for the first couple of questions that, that we pick, which has been donated by Bookaholic. Uh, so I think I'm going to start in one, which is for... Uh, oh, there's so many good questions. Where to begin? Right, I'm going to start with a question for Erica. But I've known Erica a long time, so I'm going to point out she's not allowed to talk about flies for the next 55 minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but Erica and I are very happy to be in Sofia. So to Erica, how many flies did you collect from Bulgaria, if any? And is there anything interesting here? Um, obviously, I'm not allowed to collect from Bulgaria because I haven't got permits. <laughs> and that would be wrong of me, and I can get you thrown into jail. Um, but I will probably be collecting some around a couple of pints later. <laughs> so that would be quite interesting. I could tell you a horrible fact about that if you want. Does anyone want to hear that? Of course we want. Huh? Well, you know when you're, you're sitting in the pub and there's a fly flying around your pint? That's probably one of the Drosophila, and it's called a vinegar fly. Everyone calls it fruit flies, but they're vinegar flies. Now, the last thing flies would do before they <laughs> die, well, you can guess, <laughs> and the thing is, this fly, if it's a male, it's three millimetres long, but its sperm is 5.1 centimetres long. So the next time you're fishing out a fly from your drink, just think, ooh, a little bit of protein. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I'm from Scotland, so if anybody doesn't finish their pints because of that, just pass them over. <laughs> um, the question was from Alexander P. So, Alexander, could you make your way to the back of the stage to collect your prize? Thank you. Oh, brilliant, my iPad is trying to update. Let's, let's remind me later. Okay, um, I think we'll have one on metaverses now, and this is from Nicolina, so if you could also go and collect your prize. Um, are we sure we're living in a world with just three dimensions, or maybe we just can't see some of the smaller dimensions? We're getting dangerously close to string theory here. Yeah, that's an excellent vaporos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are constantly testing this at the Large Hadron Collider at the European Center of Nuclear Research, constantly publishing that and sort of trying to get contact with extra dimensions. This experimentally, I'm an experimentalist, not a theorist, um, this would mean that some energy or some particles would, it is, it, it would escape from, from this world or missing which would be a violation of, of energy conservation in physics, which is absolutely forbidden. And our students are constantly uh, investigating that and publishing that, and, and, and down to the present, we didn't find anything. Otherwise, you would, you would have heard about that, and this would be a Nobel Prize. So, first of all, we are constantly monitoring that. That's an ex experimental question, not a hypo hypothetical one, which we are investigating. But up to the present, we didn't find anything. I hope this is, is this answering the question. I, I hope so. I think it's an excellent answer. Um, I had no idea how many pitfalls there were during a Q&A session. And I'm going to ask one slightly dangerous question, but I really admire the cheek of the person who asked it. And to spare their blushes, I'm not going to reveal who it was. Uh, Sebastian, do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> 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 Uh, so we change the subject. So <laughs> we, we don't have to answer. I'm, I'm um, you know, okay, I'm gonna give this answer. Uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, on Facebook, you can choose different things. Yeah. Well, one of the options is it's complicated. Okay. <laughs> can I just say, when you're asked in a public forum, especially if it's complicated, the safe answer is yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I did like that question. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of questions for, for Diego, um, and we'll come back to some of them later, but I want to start with one that, that has come up a few times, and, and actually I think we've all individually asked him it, um, so we have to get this one out of the way. Why the hell did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I was thinking you were going to ask me if I had a girlfriend, she's, she's sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is definitely yes, if she's in the room, right? <laughs> so. um, uh, I did it because I wanted to learn um, what, it, what it felt like and what the problems would be yeah. so that I could do what I'm doing right now, which is working in the, in the space industry and solving these very problems. Um, I also found it as a really 
big challenge, maybe the biggest challenge that I might even have in my life, something to tell my grandchildren about. So uh, that's, that's why I did it. What, and another question that, that kind of picks up on the same area. What, what was your career path that got you to the point where you did that? Well, I, 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 I was almost fresh out of school. I did um, uh, my bachelor's and master's in electronics engineering. I, I didn't even like space that much when I went to school. Um, <laughs> and when I was working on my master's thesis, I started working on a, on a university nanosatellite where my job was to design a star tracker, which are the cameras that take pictures of the stars that are in the satellites and they, um, through some analysis, calculate where the satellite is pointing at. So I spent one year looking at pictures of uh, stars and it was you know, at the same time very technical and very poetic and this made me fall in love with it. And then I worked, uh, I, I did a master's at the International Space University that I recommend to anybody interested in space um, and then I worked briefly at the European Space Agency and then I got selected. Okay, and I think one that, that we might pick up on in the space travel uh, for a moment, but for Alan, if everything in the brain is electrical impulses, do you, do you see us being able to record and back them up when creating memories mm -hmm. to store and reproduce them? I mean, I'm guessing someone's talking about not just, say, books. <laughs> <laughs> that could be possible. Um, it's very difficult. I, I think it, it's still very difficult to modelize mm. brain and memory. Um, I think the organ, the brain, I mean, I know that Erica is very enthusiastic about flies, but the brain brings you surprise all the time when you're studying. So to me right now, nothing equal what the brain can be doing. And we still find new uh, facts that change the way we think the brain, how it functions, how they're organized. We generate new neurons, we change the, the weight of the connections, so I mean, there's still a lot to learn to, to be able to mimic what's going on there. Sure. So, so to paraphrase your answer, brains are better than flies. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we, they've just mapped the brain of a fly, finally. So right. the Drosophila, they've mapped it. So they've done so 100,000 neurological networks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a little way to go from a human. But the fact that we've done this with a fly now, we can start asking all sorts of amazing questions mm -hmm. going on. So it's great. Yeah. You need flies. We, we, we are <laughs> using flies. We do have flies with Alzheimer's disease. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you've ruined Erica's day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we, yeah, we, you can really um, humanize the flies too. And uh, people are working on uh, Parkinson's disease fly. Yeah. And, and they can really monitor their way to walk after that. And, and it works. And I've seen some researcher that actually were working on the human disease, mimic it in flies, find a way of curing the mm. flies and back to human, and it worked. Yeah. So we're not very far from that, and, and flies are an incredible uh, model to mimic. Yeah. Back, back to Alan then, but if it is electrical, in regardless of the technical difficulties, mm -hmm. presumably that ought to be a possibility at some point, do you think? Possibly. Um, it, it's not, as I said, the, the more primitive animals have this direct contact and this wiring. Uh, in, in humans, it's much more complex. That's a substance that can be modulating and everything can be weighted differently. Um, so I think, for example, people now, they're using what we call deep brain stimulation. They're inserting electrodes into the brain to cure people from some disease when there is this network that is not functioning well. And so we're not very far from that. Yeah. Uh, we could be recording, maybe, maybe, yeah. and, and just re-implant it after that. Okay. And I guess picking up on some of those ideas, if that became possible, then Diego, Sebastian, can we do that if we have to send people on interstellar journeys? <laughs> That's a, a big question. Um, I mean, the, the, there's some people working on uh, generational spacecrafts, right? Where you kind of, well, that's very scientific, uh, not scientific, uh, sci-fi right now, yeah. right? So, um, but then you have to create such a big spaceship that several generations can last. Uh, yeah. 
that's a different way. Yeah. There's people talking about creating these like avatars, like in the we avatar where yeah. you can mm -hmm. control maybe with your brain some robot that is somewhere far away by plugging direct into your brain and what's the difference between you being there and and you tricking your brain into thinking that it's there. So yeah. why not? I mean one alternative to the Mormons, there is at least one science fiction novel which suggested cloning the genes from naked mole rats into humans to make them more social and more suitable for <laughs> space travel. I mean, is that something you'd have volunteered for? <laughs> no. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Thomas, a lot of people were fascinated by some of the asymmetries at different points in the universe. Um, what would happen if the percentage difference between dark matter and regular matter was different? Could you perhaps elaborate on some of that? Yeah, that's what I try to explain a bit. For example, if you would go oh, from... I did use the word elaborate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, for example, if you would go from the, from the present level of, um, of, of, of uh, 10 billions uh, to, 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 one, to 1 million, you would have such a high density of matter that the uni universe would recollapse uh, very fast within a second, mm. which definitely did not happen. <laughs> so you should not really touch this number too, mu too much. Yeah. And if you have perfect symmetry, if you put it to, to one to one or to zero, you, you would end up in an empty light bubble. That's also what we don't observe and we would not like. So this is one of the famous fine-tuned numbers which yeah, which should astonish us, and uh, yeah. Okay. So do not touch a working system. That's a, a rule for an experimental <laughs> physicist. Do not touch this universe. Good advice. <laughs> um, another one for Erica, and we'll, we'll find out a lot about Erica's opinions of human beings from this question. <laughs> so maybe we'll ask a different one. No. What's the most human thing you've seen a fly do? <sighs> Really? <laughs> uh, you've heard me talk already. Oh, God. Um, uh, a PG. Um, the, the next question won't be PG, by the way. It will be or won't <laughs> be. It won't. Um, well, you, I mean, they talk about you shouldn't humanise animal behaviour and whatever, but the more we're beginning to study it, the more you realise that humans are animals, and so everything I see in the behaviour of flies, um, I will see also in a nightclub. And um, so there's, there's lots, like one of my favourites are the flies that headbutt each other, the males that go around doing this, because they form their little territories, and it's just like a Glaswegian, so you'd understand that. <laughs> and they just, you know, it's the Glaswegian kiss, they go and headbutt each other, so the females pick whichever male's the best at beating up the other males. <laughs> so I, I find that quite human behaviour. Uh, it's always watching fun. Uh, it's always fun watching Erica try to behave. So I'm going to ask the next question, which is: Can we pick on someone else? I will in a minute. I will. Which fly has the most endurance in bed? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> there's my favourite when it comes to like sex, traumatic sex lives. Um, obviously, that's quite a nice one. So the males are a lot of the time they have they're, they're just you know flying sperm packages, which is fine. Sorry, um, <laughs> I don't know why I looked at you. <laughs> <laughs> it was because somebody asked that. I thought I'd make you blush even more. Um, so they're having their co uh, in cop midair. So they're having sex midair, and it's the little biting midges again. These lot get up to everything. And he has to, like, she flies like that, and then he has to hold on for dear life, flying. And then what she does is, midway through, she decides to pierce through his ear balls, ear eyes with her mouth parts, and he's like, ugh. And, well, I'm sure that's the noise he makes. And um, she just starts dissolving his insides out, and then, like, feeds on him whilst copulating, and he has to hope that he finishes copulating in time because basically his entire body gets desiccated, he snaps off his penis, as it were, inside her, and then afterwards she just flicks it out. Well, <laughs> I, I guess a question for the gentleman of the panel. How do you feel that, about that? That might classify <laughs> as endurance, but are we agreed that's not something we aspire to? <laughs> so, anyway. Um, 
more seriously, I have a question which I think a lot of the panel will have serious uh, thoughts on. Um, do you think there is a risk, we touched on this in your, in your panel discussion before, that as we get closer to colonizing Mars, people will become more careless towards Earth? Diego, do you want to kick off? I guess it could happen, but it's something that we should avoid. Um, really as, as, as we said also in the in the in the previous panel, like it's it's really not one or the other. It's it's both, and it's working on, on space to improve Earth, and working on on Earth to to also be able to to to, to travel to space. So it's not it's not exclusive, it, and it shouldn't be. No, yeah. Sebastian. Uh, personally, I really don't think so. I think it'll be more apparent how amazing Earth is. Uh, I mean, we are literally made for this planet. Um. May I also answer? Yeah, of course. Since, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Since we have only one world and this one beautiful planet, we should really first of all care about this planet. It's an answer from the multiverse. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, when you were talking about the previous panel about when you see us in Mars, and it's like, well, the International Panel for Climate Change has just come out with this huge report saying we've got 12 years. And before that, like, after that, we go into such um, temperature changes in our environment that we start having a massive species loss. And as I already can see my species loss, I, I go into habitats the same year again and again, and I see them drop. It fills me with huge concern, and I hope we never give up on this planet. Okay. Um, I, I have another one, I think, here, which is, is for Thomas, which is a bit more frivolous. Um, if we only have three dimensions, how do you explain 4D cinema? <laughs> <laughs> Should we just agree it doesn't exist? Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I couldn't resist that one. Go on. Um, another one about the... Um, dark energy. So how, do we have any clues about the distribution of it around the universe? Is it even? Are, are there regions yes. which might be higher? For the moment we assume it's a constant. The simplest model or the simplest idea basically follows Einstein's idea that it's a constant which he, for good reasons, he plugged in his equations. So it's really constant in space and time. And he plugged it in at that time, historically, before the expansion of the universe was discovered. So Einstein had a problem. Since due to gravity, our good old, good old universe should implode. So he needed an anti-force to, to keep it stable. Normally you don't think about that. But, I mean, you only have gravity, not anti-gravity. So he had, a real, he had a logical problem. And to keep this world stable, he introduced an a constant, the cosmological constant, but according to him, it's really constant in space and time. I'm glad you said that, because another question for you is, why don't we have anti-gravity? I don't know. That's, <laughs> no, okay. This is really a miracle. All other forces have um, charge and anti-charge. You have positive and negative charge, and this is true for all forces, except for gravity. Since and even most of my students never thought about that. Even antimatter has normal gravity, not anti-gravity. This is a real problem which is deep at the roots of the understanding or not understanding of gravity, which we cannot solve this evening. Well, we can try. No. <laughs> um, okay, for, for Alan, but the follow-up question will, I think, bring in Diego as well. Uh, are there limits to our plasticity? Well, aging is certainly the limit of plasticity. Um, we know that our brain will lose volume without losing cells, but it will start when you are about 50 years old. Um, so that's, uh, th you know, that's something that people, when you look at the anatomy, I mean, it's very different from one individual to another. So there have been worldwide studies where they put together all these anatomical studies with new imaging tools, and they found that, yes, we're losing volume, and it starts at 50, roughly. 
So the limit is definitely aging. And, and we all know that you can learn better when you're young and brain plasticity is more efficient. Yeah. You, you brought up the concept there of variation between individuals. And in fact, the follow-up question I, I had for, for Diego, do you think people who presumably like you are, are driven to experience new things and explore and try things, do you think they experience time differently? I don't know, but I mean, maybe. I mean, maybe during during the experience, I experienced time differently. I, I don't think that I experienced it in a, in general in a different way than any other human uh, during during our mission. Just because of the particular conditions of the of the mission, it was really weird from a time point of view, because every day was exactly the same. And it was like Groundhog Day. I don't know if you have watched yeah. it. That the day repeats again and again and again. And suddenly I'm sleeping through the night, and I dream of the of my childhood of being in the in the garden and whatever. And it feels like reality. And suddenly I wake up and I'm still there. Yeah. Uh, and that happens again and again and again. So it, that from that point of view, it felt it felt really different from from normal life. But but in general, and I, I think perceive time in a similar way to everybody else. Were, were there parts of it that where time dragged more than others? Was, were there parts that were especially difficult? Um, so that the scientists that are experts in this, they, they, they have this uh, theory of the, of the third quarter syndrome in which um, by the second half of the mission, then you have, okay, you have the first half behind and then now you have to do the second half and uh, that tends to give you some psychological negative uh, effects. Uh, so I didn't feel that, but some of my colleagues did. Um, to me, it was positive, negative waves during the mission because of different reasons. Um, so it was it was just throughout the mission. Very, some times were very easy, sometimes were very, very hard. I, so when it was really hard for us that we all noticed at the same time was in summer time because um, everybody was on holidays, or our family were on holidays, or friends were on holidays, and they wouldn't answer as quickly as, <laughs> as our messages, even though it yeah. was like, it normally took days or weeks for them to answer, but on, that, on those two months, they wouldn't, and that was very difficult. What was the most useful practical thing you learned for space travel, do you think, from the, the whole mission? I mean, the main thing is that, uh, the, the, it's possible that humans can go through this period of isolation uh, and confinement and, and survive that part. Uh, so I think that's the main learnings. Then there were 100 experiments, each one has their own yeah. uh, data. But to me, that was the, that was the main lesson learned. I'm, I'm going to abuse my position now by asking a question of my own, because I'm really curious. Would the other panel members consider embarking on such a mission. What would you miss and what would you want to take with you? Alan? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure I will consider myself into that sort of uh, adventure. Um, I will definitely miss my kids and family, so uh, yeah. Yeah, that will be difficult for me. I think you need to be young and strong like uh, Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas? For me, it would be a period like for uh, self-concentration, partially. Like Jesus, you or many, or Buddha who were going to the desert for 40 days and so on and so on. This would be the, the positive part. On the other hand, I, I would say instead of going to some remote, uh, to, to Mars, we should really care about this Earth. So I put into doubt the goal in a certain sense. Let's care about this Earth. Okay. Sebastian, you, you've obviously thought about it. I, yeah, so I have thought about it. And uh, so now we are designing a habitat for this, right? Uh, and me and my co-founder actually wanted to participate, but we are not old enough, so. <laughs> now you're just showing <laughs> off. <laughs> uh, uh, no, but at some point, yeah, yeah. probably I would okay. like to. Yeah. Erica? Can I come back? Well, that really is going to depend See, on your behaviour. I, I would, I would go because I would be curious. I would, but I, I would, I would really struggle without green. I'd really struggle without life. It would be 
Like, but I'd get some work done. If you can bring some flies, probably. There's not a lot and of pet flies. flies. <laughs> Maybe they can mutate into something awesome. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't care to speculate on the motives of the person asking this question. Um, Alan, does LSD promote brain, brain plasticity? <laughs> Well, LSD was used to cure people with psychosis, uh, and it was very popular in the 50s. I think a lot of the, uh, the cine, uh, cinema stars in the US were experiencing uh, LSD, going to their doctors uh, to take some LSD to really improve the function of the brain. Um, all what we call psychoactive um, compounds are changing the brain. And uh, yes, some of them are promoting more plasticity. And it's, uh, it's a very interesting way of promoting more. And I think you know, that we can cure people, help people to recover from brain injury by stimulating uh, the, the, the other neuron by pharmacological compound that can be considered as drugs for, uh, in, in many countries. So they, um, there's a lot of work with maggots where they're feeding them loads of different drugs to look at development. Mm -hmm. Because obviously a lot of the crime scenes, the maggots on um, the, the buccal area, the nasal area, were a completely different development to the other regions. Mm -hmm. So they were looking at that and they found it completely stimulated the de early development. So it, uh, uh, overactivity, so within, in, instead of a three-week life cycle, it was a one-week life cycle. Mm -hmm. But the impact on the adult was nothing. So this was on cocaine, but then they used other drugs, and LSD, and they found it was during the pupil stage that it all went a bit bonkers. So they're, they're practicing with all these drugs because the effect it has on the neurological pathways is completely different. Mm -hmm. It's quite fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this came up in one of the radio interviews you did. What, what can we do to improve our neuroplasticity? Do we want to improve it? Well, we are doing that during the whole, whole life, um, when we are reading, when we are learning things, when we are participating to that sort of uh, scientific meeting, yes, you, you, you're changing the way your brain is functioning. So, um, but also physical exercise will change the way the brain is, is functioning. So all these things are important, but uh, as I said during the, the radio interview, it's, it's common sense. You have to preserve your brain. You have to do exercise even if you're in a confined environment. You have to do that. You have to stimulate your brain to make it stronger. We, we've talked briefly about how drugs can affect neuroplasticity. Can we do anything in the opposite direction? Is there hope for treating uh, people suffering from addiction by using what we're learning about neuroplasticity? Yes, there's a, a very large... Um, number of people that are actually working on this subject, and mostly in the US, it's, it's a cultural thing. I think in Europe, people are not too keen to uh, try to cure people that are taking drugs on their own will. Um, in the US, they see that as an economical problem. You're losing a lot of money because people are taking drugs, and they try to cure these people, and, and to th think as drug addicts as people that need to be helped. Um, so uh, yes, they, they found um, some ways of treating these people with compounds and recently some uh, researcher came to our labs and, and she was giving a talk and, and she showed that the brain of drug addicts could be treated by electrical stimulation and to reverse the addiction. So that's definitely uh, something that attracts a lot of people. There's quite a lot of work on addiction using flies as well. Yeah, we get flies drunk because it's um, unethical to get humans drunk. Um, <laughs> that's know. just your I, opinion. I, I, it's, it's not my opinion. <laughs> I think it's totally fine for us to get drunk. But they are, so they've been looking at the genes completely. Yeah, so they've been able to find, now we've found out what the, the genes are associated with alcohol dependency and things like that. Switching them on and off and doing all sorts of funky stuff with that, yeah. Okay. In, in terms of colonising Mars, 
who would be the most indispensable type of person? Who would you pick first? <laughs> I might ask the rest of the panel this as well. Well, I think that you, you always need this uh, kind of uh, people that are that, that, that are skilled at at uh, hand uh, work. Like uh, really, we need we need plumbers and plumbers on Mars. Fundamentally, that's who we need. Uh, so, in, in terms yeah. of uh, uh, professional skills, that's the, that's what I would say first. Like hands work. Yeah. Anyone else uh, want to chip in? No, I completely agree, because we always have the pub conversation of what you do in a zombie apocalypse, because obviously that's <laughs> what we care about. And I looked at my friends, and the value of 90% of my friends is pointless, because <laughs> I, need, I, needed, like, I needed a plumber, I need an electrician, I need all that. And there's very few people that can do that. So it was like, you're, well, there's an archery friend, he could stay, because he can kill the zombies. But yeah, it's that sort of skills that I think is needed. See, I'm now struggling to think of the next question because I'm one of Erica's friends and I'm now <laughs> trying to work out... I'm Are not. In I'm in the 90%. We yeah. know I'm in the 90%. I think, just for fun, I'm going to ask the panel to nominate two famous people each who you're going to send to Mars <laughs> on a one-way mission <laughs> and really? on a two-way mission. <laughs> Go on, then. Well, he's it's a, it's a, it's a rather famous... Red-headed ginger American at the moment. He's one way. <laughs> You're being very cautious. <laughs> you know, I'm not allowed to have a political opinion. And um, anyone involved in Brexit, they can go one way. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe we can download our memories because we're not going to be able to get visas for the next rats. <laughs> yeah, um, you're right. And, and we'll be too busy starving and feeding on rats in post-Brexit. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. yeah. Sebastian, who would, who would you dispense with? Um, I would probably, <laughs> well, you took the quite obvious word right there, uh, but, um, so he, he's might not s very famous, but I would definitely send my dad on a, a two-way trip just yeah. to show him what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> uh, it's like, that, this is the red planet I'm talking about, you know, yeah. um, and a one-way ticket, um, I don't know, that's, that's, uh, I'll, I'll keep that to myself, I think. <laughs> It's complicated. Who, what about you? <laughs> it's, it's complicated, yeah. <laughs> There's a theme going here. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> On a one-way ticket, I would send uh, Putin and Trump together. Yeah. 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 They should <laughs> They'd be very happy. And they should solve their conflict in a little box. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no. yeah. A two-way uh, ticket, I would, I would love to send, okay, my son and my wife. Yeah. What can I say after that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a few names, uh, but um, you don't know them. But I will send them to Mars <laughs> and stay for a period of time. You, uh, you have a list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've all, of we've all answered. Yeah, okay. If everybody in the panel chips in, uh, we can send Donald Trump at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Okay. Um, we're going back to multiverses now, mm. and the idea that the universe we're in is one of many, and only this one survived. Is that plausible? Have we had repeated attempts yeah. at a universe? Um, I don't see any concept of concurrence and hence of survival. I rather see a concept of, of, of coexistence in uh, multiple dimensions, uh, since I don't see universes dying primarily. So this, is, this, this to me is not a question. It's rather the question how many, let's call it parallel universes are existing, how many alternatives are still alive. The question of death is not so important. Anyway, Big Bang is not so far away that I assume that so many universes have died already. That's not the point. Okay. Yeah. And another one for you. Um, at the spring event, we had a, a fantastically entertaining talk from Holm Humler about the misuse of physics in other fields, and particularly marketing. What do you well? What do you think of that? First of all, and where do you stand on the idea that we only have a universe because we can observe it? 
Yeah, first of all, you should use much more physics in everyday life and you should be more, uh, I would promote uh, much more literacy in physics and I don't see the, the problem of, 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 of abuse normally. So you should use much more of physics. For example, I, okay, I don't want to become political, but the, the switch of, of, of nuclear power stations in Germany, to me this is completely irrational, in, in, in particular from a chancellor who has a PhD in physics. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If she would apply her physics um, knowledge, and we have the safest nuclear power stations in Germany, and so on, and there's a zero risk of earthquakes of, of, order, of order of aid in Germany and of, of uh, tsunamis and so on. This, to me, is a sign of irrationality. So I would, I would like to ask lay people and politicians to switch their brain on and to activate their physics knowledge, in particular of my dear chancellor. Yeah, <laughs> that's a partial answer. I think perhaps starting with Sebastian on the next one, but I'm, I'm sure other people will have opinions too. We, we've talked about the time frame for establishing a, a permanent colony on Mars of, of 200 or so. And we talked a little bit in the panel discussion uh, about uh, preserving any extraterrestrial life. How far should we go with terraforming Mars? We talked about living in bubbles. Do we restrict ourselves to bubbles? or do we try and turn Mars into Earth? Um, do you mean aesthetically? Or aesthetically, morally, morally both. Um, I think we need to do whatever we need to do. Um, if we need to live in a cliff to protect ourselves from radiation, I think we need to do that. Um, I don't see any reason in the nearer future to terraform Mars. Okay. Any other comments, Diego? Well, well, there are different opinions, of course. Uh, what we were mentioning about life on Mars, okay, what happens if there was life on Mars and, and you just completely made a new planet Earth with new living beings and completely eliminated this new life form that was forming there? Um, in my opinion, we, I mean, what we have as a civilization is is very special and uh, it's it's... I think it's worth preserving and expanding to another planet is, is one step towards that, towards preventing this Earth that has such a complex uh, set of life forms from disappearing completely. Um, that's maybe the long-term goal and, and, and this helps prevent it and therefore I, I agree with, with, with terraforming Mars. Yeah. Erica, you're very active in conservation on this planet. What do you feel about conservation on Mars? So I work with some astrobiologists, which is quite fun. <laughs> and, and one of the big ethics questions is this bacteria in space and, and if, if we do come across whatever. So we have quite categorically buggered this planet in many ways. And every time we go into a new habitat, humans take a load of crap with them. And we've really got a we've got to be careful about doing that. And suddenly you let us out into space and taking all our nice viruses and everything with us, we do not know the impact. No. So I'm very much live in a bubble first and then let's figure out what's there and then just, you know, just go gently into the night. That's a cheerful note. Yeah. Um, I have another question for, for Erica. She's already referred to zombie apocalypses, and she clearly frightened the life out of at least some members of the audience because the question's about pandemics and how can we get the flies on our side? Can we use them? We, we, we use them a lot. Um, we are. See, I, um, are you talking about vectors and how we're going to deal with that? Is that the... So, I mean, I worry because everyone's talking about going out and killing all the mosquitoes, and I think this is completely the wrong way of going about it because mosquitoes like having sex, and they just adapt really quickly. So they, we're just about to... We know in Uganda, we're releasing all these sterile insects again, and we've been doing this for quite a while, and it has no impact because basically the, the mutation rate within the flies is too quick. So what we really need to do is really start focusing on looking at a uh, smaller scale, looking at the plasmodium, looking at the viruses, and breaking disease transmission. And by doing that, we need to understand the ecology, we need to understand the behavior, as well as the genetics. So what we need to do is to actually spend more money on people like me, <laughs> traveling around the world, looking at what's going on in our environment. We, we, we go in so ham-fisted into many situations. 
And this level of ignorance has caused this proliferation of these yeah. sort of yeah. events. We, we don't have a good track record of biological control in a lot of cases. No, we don't, and, and we don't actually know our biology. Like, there's 1.9 million described species on the planet, and, you know, uh, a conservative estimate is there's 10 million. And that's not even beginning to understand fungi and bacteria because yeah. we can't speciate those at a proper level at the moment. So we, we've, we've just got to really kind of understand what we're doing. Okay. Uh, Alan, back to memory. Um, I, I, as a 52-year-old, was delighted to hear that these pathologies kick in at about 50. So <laughs> I'm clinging to the comfort of this next question. Do you think it's possible that forgetting is an evolutionary development that allows humans to function properly and change. So is it a development or is it something that's simply invisible to selection because of the age at which it kicks in? No, no, it's, it's actually necessary to forget things. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there, there, there was, well, there is people that train their brain to, to be extremely good in memories. And, uh, I remember some of my colleagues have been studying the brain of this guy that was able to calculate just by his mind. You, you could ask him uh, how much was the, the multiply millions by, and he could give you the answer just right away. And um, so this guy has trained his brain so much that he could really generate answers that the normal human being wouldn't be able to. Um, but after a while, um, when the, you train your brain so much, uh, it's just specialized on one aspect of this function. So what uh, forgetting is doing is really bringing back your brain to a stage where you can learn again. And we know exactly how it works. We have found that these synapses that are growing when you are making memories, they are disappearing when you are forgetting. You can block the system and, and you will have problems. And in, in traumatic brain injury, well, you know, the, the post-traumatic uh, syndrome, the thing that the people have problem to forget what they've been going through. And so if we can actually stimulate the, the, the loss of memory for these people, we might be curing their syndromes. So there is both ways. I mean, that's the same. Uh, coin with two sides, and both of them are necessary. Okay. Yeah, Thomas, yeah, you I would say that forgetting is, is also important to separate the important from the unimportant thing, sure. things. And if, if everything you, you experience in your life has this head, the same importance, you get crazy. Mm -hmm. You need this, this waiting. And even st normal computers uh, regularly make a garbage collection. I mean, forgetting is a garbage collection which you have in any computer. Another question for you. I, I, I'm guessing this is someone quite young, because this is a very optimistic question, taking the kind of long view here. And I do mean long. If we don't have enough inflation and there is a collapse, can we expect another Big Bang? They're planning ahead. <laughs> yes. There are, there are theories of a bouncing universe which are very attractive. This is a, um, a theoretically and, and experimentally open question. Yeah, I don't want to go into more details here. It's, uh, yeah, we may have a bouncing universe coming back. This is also in Indian philosophy and so on and so on. It may be real for the moment, for the moment we, what we are observing, and I'm pointing to the Nobel Prize 2010, is uh, slightly, um, uh, s speeding up inflation, so for the moment experimentally by observation, um, uh, a recollapse is not so probable. Yeah. But in principle, I agree, it could, it could be like that. Okay. S Sebastian, I've got a, a fascinating question here for you, which I, I kind of want to ask in very slightly modified form. I'm uh, getting a little worried now. No, no, tr trust me, this is, I'm going to invent a new discipline here. This is theoretical architecture. And the question is from uh, Ventsy, in fact. What about colonizing Venus with zeppelins above the atmosphere? So as, as well as that, my question is, what planet would you like to be able to design structures on? What would be the most fun, the most different from Earth? High gravity, low gravity, molten metals, who knows? Well, okay, so 
I guess within the the field of space architecture might be a boring space architecture because um, I've actually only worked with the Mars and Moon. Um, <laughs> So maybe I should explore other planets more. You're, you're saying you're too narrow in yeah, your I'm interest. Too, I'm too, yeah. <laughs> Focusing on <laughs> this unexplored I'm too planet. realistic. Yeah, way, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, fair enough. Um, right, what do we have here? Um, yeah, so people are quite uh, curious about your professional background and how you ended up in, in this field. How, how did this happen? Um, I'm an architect from an art academy in Denmark. Uh, so, th th that is really strange. There's no <laughs> uh, real co correlation, except that, uh, you know, uh, architects design for humans. Doesn't matter if they're humans on Earth, or if they're humans in space, a human is still a human. So many of the same things uh, are the same. Uh, so, a lot of the things that, that you teach, maybe not architectural history, it's not so relevant, uh, but but, and actually, really, if you think about, I think some of the best architecture is actually architecture looking at the human being, right? Looking at uh, what the human being needs from a biological or like a evolutionary point of view. Um, and those things are completely relevant in space architecture. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so it's 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 an art academy background, and then I did uh, similar like like you, uh, uh, an intense graduate level program at the International Space University, which I can also really recommend. Yeah. <laughs> Are they one of our sponsors? I should <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it's, no, okay. it's, it's intense and it's, it's, it's very great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought one of the most fascinating bits, for me at least in the panel discussion earlier, was things like the use of wood rather than you know, plastic and aluminium. I, I know Petco wasn't impressed with the design, I, I would point out someone has added a, a, an appendix to their question saying that they actually liked it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm guessing Petco will comment on that at the end. What, what do you think about this? You know, we're going to end up with chintz covered space capsules and uh, crocheted blankets and duvets and things, you know. <laughs> uh, well, okay, actually, right now, the Soyuz capsule that brings people to the International Space Station, there's actually wooden elements in it already, but they're, yeah. they're kind of hidden. Um, so wood is, the, is, is used, um, but even before I met uh, Diego, I, I, I knew about the, the Mars 500, and I was very fascinated about the material used because that's it's quite unique. It's not really used anywhere else, uh, and I think it's the right direction. I think maybe they overdid it a little yeah. bit. <laughs> they, they, they didn't really uh, see that much in the photo because there was, there was a lot of wood. Maybe yeah. I would put in some other things as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and another benefit of the wood that's very interesting is the, the, the fact that you can modify it. Uh, yeah. So this, this is something that maybe uh, my Russian uh, organizers of the experiment didn't like so much, but uh, uh, at some point we needed, like uh, uh, we were doing exercise on the, on the treadmill and we wanted something to put our laptops to watch serious yeah. while we were exercising. <laughs> <laughs> so we went and cut a piece from <laughs> some of the walls. <laughs> <laughs> and assemble a tray for laptops in front of the machine. So it's uh, it's useful too. I, I can <laughs> see that not going down very well <laughs> with the organizers. Yeah, I mean they they just they want us they wanted us to be happy there. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned some of the the physical side effects of extended periods in, in space, and you you talked a little bit about the things you missed during the simulation. Did you find it difficult to adjust? You know, coming back to Earth? Um, the, so, in general, the coming back to Earth immediately is, I see it as an extremely positive experience. Mm. The, the day that I came out of the capsule was, as of today, the best day of my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I went out and I just saw different people, I ate different food, I saw the sun for the first time, I saw a dog, I saw a <laughs> baby, I will never forget any of yeah. this. Um, but then there is some period of adjustment because clearly you come back to this world that you haven't been in and uh, the lives of your friends and your family have gone through things that you're not aware of and you need to catch up with these things. 
and this, and this takes time. And uh, this happens with the people that come from Antarctica, that come from space, uh, to me, that maybe it takes six months to, to sort of adapt, uh, maybe one year. Um, but it, it takes some time. Okay. Mm. On that quite optimistic note, after all the death and doom we've had throughout the day, th thank you, Erica, um, I, I think it's sadly time to draw things to a close. I think uh, Vasily is coming up to do another draw. Um, I'm going to finish with one of the, the questions which isn't actually a question, but as someone who has no role in organising this and is completely unbiased, I thought it captured it perfectly. Someone instead of submitting a question, basically said, well done, you guys, you nailed it again. You've gone from the tiniest flies to the largest of universes. Well done. So I would echo that as well. Say thank you to our panel, and actually thank you to a really appreciative audience. <laughs>